Hello, Happy New Year, and welcome to this week's episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Before we start, I want to announce that today's episode is the first of three episodes this month to have a companion episode over on Patreon.com. These Patreon-exclusive mini-episodes will become a regular feature and will usually contain either a topic of conversation we expanded on or, like today, an in-depth look at a piece of music discussed in the main interview. To hear these mini-companion episodes, go to patreon.com forward slash a mic on the podium and for the price of a glass of wine each month, you can subscribe and listen to these episodes, a monthly bulletin and a whole new exclusive set of interviews. Details are also available in the show notes below. Today, I chat to an English conductor who has held title positions in both Germany and the Netherlands and is due to start as chief conductor of the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra in 2021. He is arguably best known for conducting the Aurora Orchestra since its foundation in 2004. It's a real pleasure to welcome Nicholas Collon. Nick, great to speak to you today. How are you? Are you well? I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, really good to speak to you too, mate. Are you, like me, um, not looking at scores, or are you just gently working your way through new music and, and using the time in that way? Well, I'd love to say that I'm exploring late Schoenberg at the moment, but um, <laughs> truth is, with three kids in the house, I'm, I'm not doing anything other than domestic um, niceties. So. Actually, it's, it's been a really nice time to spend more time with the family because, as you know, being a conductor takes you away from home. So it's been, it's been very full on at home. Uh, well, um, my hat goes off to you because I bet you that is full on being a sort of home teacher and, and doing all of that. So, yeah, bravo to you. Um, as ever, I go back to the very beginning. And how did music first come into your life when you were a child? I was very fortunate to be brought up in a musical family. Uh, my grandmother was my piano teacher. She was a very fine pianist and a really wonderful teacher. My mother was my violin teacher and I had three uh, older sisters, still have three older sisters. Um, none of them went into music, but they all were playing instruments. Um, so the house was full of music of different qualities and standards um, <laughs> all the way throughout the day. And uh, I, I suppose it never occurred to me not to be listening to music in some form or, or other. So, you know, I was, a, I was very fortunate. I was surrounded by it as a kid and uh, I, I found it everywhere I looked. So you just said that you had violin lessons, uh, but I also read that you were a viola player in the National Youth Orchestra. So did you do um, what I did, actually, which is pick up the viola a little bit later on and ended up getting into youth orchestra so I'm a viola first. Yeah I played the violin until I was about 13 and a half maybe 14 and then my one of my teachers at school said um, you've got quite big hands in fact I don't think I do have big hands so I, I'm not sure why he said that probably he just thought I wasn't going to cut it as a violinist mm. um, and coincidentally the weekend before my mum just for fun has said why don't you pick up a viola and see if you can read the clef? Mm. And, and, and the two things happened within about three days of each other. And I suppose made me think, oh, this is, this is quite fun. So I uh, picked up the viola then and, and completely changed a couple of weeks later. So I was from then on a viola player. Mm. Well, I do have massive hands. And uh, in fact, I was in a rehearsal recently with the Conservatory Orchestra in Birmingham and happened to drop out that, you know, that my hands were big enough to stretch an octave on the viola between the first and second finger. Mm. And the principal viola said, oh, you're joking, prove it. So I had to prove it, which I can, I can do. My hands are that big, which means that I maybe should have stayed on viola the, uh, rather than go back to violin, which is what I eventually did. Uh, it's funny the reasons that teachers give, isn't it, for swapping to an instrument that is less popular than the others? I think in truth, I went um, to a very musical school and I had three you know, complete Wunderkind violinists in my ah, year. Right, uh, okay. But who were playing on TV at the age of eight, you know. I wasn't that. And um, and there were enough of them. Uh, but it was a great move, totally yeah. brilliant for me, because I adored play the, playing the viola. It gave me access to chamber music and orchestras. And uh, I, lo I love the instrument. I think it's, mm. you know, a beautiful thing. 
Yeah, my mum always said she preferred when I played the viola. She preferred the sound. Um, so there we go. You were also a piano and organist and became an organ scholar um, at Cambridge. That's right, isn't it? That's correct, yeah. Mm. And what was musical life at Cambridge like for you, being an organ scholar? Um, how busy were you on the organ? Oh, okay. it was incredibly intense, hectic and chaotic. <laughs> um, trying, trying probably um, and failing to juggle lots of instruments at the same time. I mean, the, the organ I started when I was, I think, just turned 14. And I adored the instrument. I, I used to practice it a lot. And it's a wonderful thing to play. And the repertoire is fantastic. It's a very uh, solitary, lonely and stressful instrument unless you're exceptionally good at it. I mean, it really, it's so difficult to play well. And uh, I, I think I, I found, it was no secret, uh, I found being an organ scholar <laughs> quite a tough thing, actually. You know, the churn of repertoire. Every week you were expected to learn all the music for service, uh, and and some of it's really quite difficult, you know. And 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 it's in in this English choral tradition, you're basically sight reading the stuff all the time because you get forty five minutes rehearsal and then an even song, and then the next day a forty five minutes rehearsal and another even song and different music, you know. Uh, so it was um, I was up practicing till one o'clock in the morning most days on the organ in the chapel probably stopping some people sleeping. And then I was getting up and trying to play the viola in orchestras and, and conducting and, you know, pretending to do a, a degree. Mm. So did conducting start at Cambridge? Well, before really, um, mm. I did little pieces, you know, nothing, nothing big, of course, but, you know, Carnival of the Animals. And I conducted choirs quite a lot uh, as a teenager. And then, yeah, certainly it really kicked off when I was about um, 18, 19 at Cambridge. And how did it manifest itself? Were you conducting groups that were already formed uh, or did you go down the route of thinking, I want to conduct, so I'm going to form a little orchestra? Or I mean, I mean, I know that came later. We'll come to that soon. But what what were those early experiences and who were they with? Well, the first one was the choral route which i was very fortunate so tim brown who was the director of music who was fantastic actually went on a sabbatical when i was in my uh, uh second year i think or first year and we uh, myself and nick rimmer who's the other organ scholar he's now a fantastic pianist uh we took over running the choir and you know that was amazing this rolls royce student choir who were fantastic and able to sing anything so i was already sort of locked into the, the choral route and then orchestrally yeah I did some conducting of the university orchestras but I suppose I already had the the, the hankering after setting up my own thing I don't mm. know why mm. um, but I set up groups and I uh, we performed lots of of repertoire I mean you know big things like there's Matthew Passion we put on which was a huge event uh, and uh, I don't know Carmen and Barana and um, <laughs> all well, the big things yeah, quite big things, exactly. I mean, that, that's what happens at Cambridge. You're, you're foolishly sort of aim incredibly high and do all these enormous things. Uh, but, but why not? So lots of conducting when you're at Cambridge. Were you having any lessons? And... What with coupled with being an organ scholar and conducting, it seems amazing that at this time you formed the Aurora Orchestra with some of your student colleagues. So how did that all happen all at once? Well, at Cambridge, I had uh, I went to London for lessons with Peter Stark. Mm, that's a name, yeah, yeah. Took me apart a little bit and showed me how to, um, <laughs> you know, beat in a way that four didn't look like three, put it mm. that way. <laughs> and uh, and that was really really useful. Then when I left Cambridge, I um, we finished at the same time. Robin Tichart and myself. So Robin, as you will know, uh, another conductor, and we were in the same year at Clare College mm. doing music. And right at the end of university, so in our last term, was spawned the idea of starting an orchestra. Mm. And that happened the first term after we left Cambridge when we moved to London. Uh, so that was, we were probably both 21 years old, I guess. 
Um, and then that happened quite quickly. And within six months or so, we gave a concert at LSO Luke's in London. Mm. And did you have any help in sort of all of the bureaucratic stuff in the background, like the booking of LSO St. Luke's, like forming, you know, booking the players? I mean, I'm sure you had friends that you'd worked with that were willing to come and play, but not enough to fill a whole orchestra. Did you have background help or were you and Robin doing it all on your Todd? There were two other people who set it up with us. Louis Watt, who's actually been the chairman of the orchestra up until this year, so a long, long time supporter. He's not in music anymore. And Clemmy Burton Hill, who you probably mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, you know, BBC um, personality, as we should say. Uh, yeah. And she, she were, and Louis were fantastic at helping to get the thing off the ground because obviously it doesn't start itself. It needed people to give donations towards it. And we, you know, we, we set up quite early on a, a sort of friends and patrons scheme. It needed, as you say, all the administrative side of setting up the, the contract with the halls and um, bringing players on board and how to pay them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, that was, was quite a big, um, well, quite a small actually, uh, but very committed team who wanted to make the thing work. Mm. And going after that initial concert in St. Luke's, then how often uh, in a year were you going to were you putting on concerts and were you um, getting together? Well, not very often at the beginning. Mm. Um, so a couple of lucky things happened after that. We were asked to do a project with Michael Clark Dance Company at the Barbican, um, Stravinsky Ballets, and Albra offered us a sort of annual residency which at least gave us some work because, you know, we, we committed to paying players from the very beginning of the orchestra and uh, <laughs> there's no model that works it, it, uh, in its foundation to, to enable that. So having a couple of bits of, of paid sort of professional help were really um, instrumental. And, and I suppose, yeah, in the, in the early days, we only gave... I don't know, a handful of concerts in the first two or three years, maybe up to 10 performances or something. It was very, very small. Mm. Which means that you've got time to be mentored or go and have some lessons with other people. And the two names leap off the list of people that you you saw. Uh, Sir Mark Elder, who I've interviewed on here, and also Sir Colin Davis, who I'd love to know what it was like to be mentored and taught by those two and whether there were any big differences between them. Um, so Mark, uh, actually I assisted, as, I was assistant conductor every summer for the first three or four summers after I left Cambridge, I went to Bregenz Festival in Austria, mm. which was wonderful, you know, amazing way to learn German. And I was assistant conductor on different operas and I assisted Mark on Shimonovsky's King Roger. Yes. Uh, incredible piece. Um, and that was the first time I, I met Mark and uh, he was wonderful and very helpful um, towards me uh, actually at that point. But funnily enough, I mean, I, I, I went up to see a few rehearsals with the Halle and that kind of thing. Um, I, I never uh, sort of, you know, I, I didn't um, continue a, a, a relationship of, um, learning from him or indeed really from from someone like Colin either um in a way I've I suppose I've wanted to go at it on my own mm. with, uh, and, and not feel too too dependent on a particular conducting mentor as it were so I've, yeah. I've you know I know lots of people do do it a different way and I've, I've wanted to just be my own conductor so the same with Colin I saw Colin a handful of times and and we had a wonderful time sitting down and, you know, he would sort of sing through Symphony Fantastique or whatever. Uh, and you'd, you'd, you'd pick up grains of, of beauty from him. <laughs> um, but I, I, I didn't want to be anything, you know, too long term to do with him either. It, it, some, somehow I wanted to just carve my own path, I suppose. Well, I suppose by meeting personalities like Sir Colin and Sir Mark, that, as you said, you pick up, you know, grains of wisdom or pearls of wisdom from them that you you aren't going to get from just doing it. That sometimes you do need to hear somebody say things like that. But I think you're also right in the fact that you do need to form a path for yourself. Um, however, you you take the strands of education and learning from wherever they come from, whether it's from Peter Stark or Colin or Mark or just through doing it. I think that's really important. 
Yeah, I think it is. And, and also, I mean, watching rehearsals is a fantastic way of learning. I spent a year as um, Vladimir Yurovsky's assistant at the London Philharmonic Orchestra um, and seeing the, the crazy repertoire that he got through was, was mm. very informative. On the other hand, I used to pop in to rehearsals um, of, say, Simon Rattle. I've been to loads of rehearsals of Simon's, but I never really wanted... It was funny, I, I probably, it was about 10 years after going to rehearsals of his and I'd been to loads and loads before I ever met him. I didn't want to impose myself on him. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to see him work and that's all I wanted. I didn't care if he knew that I existed or not. I just wanted to, to um, gain my insight into what he was. And, mm. that, uh, and of course, that's an astonishing way of learning, isn't it? To see a conductor in rehearsal that is nothing better. No, I know. I mean, I've said it to assistant conductors in Birmingham who've come after me, who've done that, as you did with um, Yurovsky and, sit, and, and the LPO, which is sit in other people's rehearsals. And I've said to them, go to all of them. Don't just go to the music directors. Go to the, the, you know, the light music on a Friday night. Go to the kids' concerts on a Sunday. And you will learn from all of the conductors, be they good or bad, be they genius or whatever. Um, there's so much you can learn. From that. I mean, by watching Simon Rattle, in my view, he was the best rehearser I ever, ever played for when I was a player. So, yeah, you're going to learn so much. And then watching the bad ones, as we always say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the bad. I think you learn more from the bad ones than you do the good ones. But, you know, that, that's that. So, through the LPO, assistant conductor and on, and uh, the Aurora Orchestra then gets uh, its first prom in 2011. And now the proms, until this year, obviously, when the proms aren't happening in their usual form, you've appeared every year for six years and you play everything from memory. Not just you, whole orchestra. I wonder, firstly, could you tell me whose idea that was and whether at the time you thought, can we do this? Um, how did that come about? It was my idea, and it was a conversation with Roger Wright, who was then director of the proms. Mm. We were performing a huge piece by Benedict Mason called Meld, which was written for an enormous orchestra and choir, and they were going to be on click track all around the Albert Hall. It was spatially um, choreographed. It was very, very clever, so you'd have a violinist in each of the boxes on the grand tier and, and the sound would pass around between them, you know. Uh, and we decided that in order to play that piece, they'd basically need to memorise these snippets of music. It wasn't particularly hard, it was sort of like 13 little A5 cards. Uh, but we thought they should memorise it. So then we thought, well, what are we going to put with it? And anything on the stage of the Albert Hall with music stands just seemed a little bit odd in in contrast to it, mm. to stand alongside it. So I thought, well, why not do Mozart G minor, the 40th symphony, uh, without music? Because we'd sort of talked about it a bit as an orchestra before. Um, and, and we, you know, I spoke to a few players and I thought, okay, let's try it, let's go for it. It's not the ideal scenario <laughs> to experiment <laughs> with something, to be honest, um, in a prom, but in some ways having the, uh, the impetus of doing that and knowing that it will be quite a, a profiled thing actually, uh, you know, helped because it made me at least know that people would bother to look at the music. Um, so, yeah, no, and I, then I remember having two, two weeks before the first rehearsal, I went to another prom, it was in the middle of the season, and an unnamed wonderful pianist playing Mozart, a major piano concerto, had a memory slip in the slow movement cadenza and then um, the orchestra tried to come back in and it was, it was pretty sort of avant-garde for about <laughs> four seconds. Um, and I, my heart sank. I just thought, Nick, what are you doing? If an amazing soloist who knows this piece backwards has the capacity to play a wrong, you know, take a wrong turn mm. in the middle of the, the heat of the moment, well, why on earth do you think that, that whatever, 45 players are not going to do the same? I mean, this is going to be the most embarrassing thing you, you've ever suggested. And I felt awful about it. And the next day I sent all these emails around to the players saying with huge charts and uh, these extraordinary things for how they should memorise and going from this bar to this bar. And I, when I got to the first rehearsal, I, I said, I, I hope these were useful. And it turned out that not a single person had opened my PDF document. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and, and then by the end of three hours, um, it was perfect. The entire orchestra was playing the whole piece entirely from memory, and we had about six rehearsals lined up. <laughs> um, so, so it was wonderful. We could we did a huge amount, you know, musically. Uh, it was, in other words, far smoother than I could ever have hoped, and has mm. always been. So, I mean, just to, to really highlight, and um, the orchestra's done six pieces: Mozart forty, Beethoven six, Mozart forty one, Beethoven three, Schostakovich nine, and last year the Berlioz Symphonie Fantastique which I saw uh, the broadcast of on BBC TV, which was superb. And what learning a piece from memory really helped to there was the, the, the element that you gave that concert with the, the narrator and the orchestra moving in and out and, and being in sections that could move around. Um, how much rehearsal time do you have for this? And also, how much time do you give your players to learn the part from memory so that when you go to the, the first rehearsal it's already to a level to a to a point where you can rehearse yeah good questions um we've also actually learned brahms one and shoskovich nine um but not not in proms and brahms one was, was interesting because that's actually probably the hardest piece that we've learned yeah. as well for anyone who's intending to do it <laughs> um there's ho horrible chromatic second violin parts uh but um each player, of course, takes their own process to it. I think there's an understanding that by the first rehearsal, they should know 80, 90% of it. So when we rehearse, absolutely none of the process is talking about memorization, I would mm. say. Um, it's all just like normal musical rehearsal, but quite in depth. Um, so there's no sense that we go over a bit because we want to memorize it. And I guess that has passed down from player to player to, you know, when new people are invited into it, they probably get a sense of that from other players somehow or watching it. Uh, so some players, I think, you know, <laughs> there are those who, who fly by the skin of their scruff of their necks and, and <laughs> maybe uh, don't do so much based on the um, belief that they've played the piece so many times they know it. And there are others who spend 40, 50 hours on, on learning a piece. And of course, it depends what instrument you're playing and how involved the part is and what the piece is. Mm. Uh, but I have to say they're incredibly conscientious. And uh, But it's a thrill, you know, it's, it's wonderful to think of all these people across what, the UK and into France or whatever, who are spending, let's say six weeks, two months before a project, thinking about the music in that mm. way. Uh, mm. And, you know, I'll get the odd sort of WhatsApp group um, the double bass section who send me a thing saying, have you ever thought about why that's a, an A and not an F in the development section of, of this Mozart symphony? And you look at it and you think, hang on, that's gotta be wrong. Mm. <laughs> and it, like, things like that, that you would just fly through if you were playing it um, with the music in front of you. There's a, there's a level of, of depth and care and understanding that is, is so thrilling to be part of. I'm gonna take it slightly further now, one step further that, you know, looking at where you were chief conductor with the Residency Orchestra in The Hague, and then you're, you're soon to start as chief conductor with the Finnish Radio Orchestra, Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra. Would you ever have asked, either in The Hague or in Helsinki, when you, when you start there, would you ever ask them to learn a piece from memory um, and ch sell them the benefits of doing so? Um, and what do you think the benefits are, not only for the orchestra, but also for the audience? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Actually, I have discussed with the residency. We had some slight plans to do that kind of thing. Uh, I think that, you know, being very practical about it, it is a lot easier to do with a non-contract orchestra yeah. because we invite players into the project and they can say no. Mm. If, and we, of course, there have been people, I'm sure, they may not have given us that as a reason, but who've not wanted to memorise a piece or don't have time or don't have the desire to and they just say no. Whereas if you're suggesting to a group of people who are paid on a, on a contract to be there um, as members, you know, that, that they have to go and memorize this piece, there will be people who, who would find that difficult or who would complain about it. So yeah. I'm not sure it would work within that model in, unless you have a really enlightened group of individuals who all want to do that. Um, I think the benefits for any group of musicians are huge. I wouldn't have necessarily guessed that when we first started. Hmm. I say it was an experiment, but um, 
uh, and also I, I put my heart on my sleeve and say, I'm really not someone who suggests that this is <laughs> the new way of performing <laughs> music. It's, uh, it's one way. It's not a way that will necessarily improve or help everybody. But, and, and also I'm not saying that when we perform from memory, it's, it's in any way better than anyone else's version, you know, but for us, it is, um, it's something which allows the musicians to access all areas of the music, I suppose, in a deeper way. I think that really is true, that they spend more time with it in preparation, that they understand the phrase structures and the harmony particularly, mm. uh, and what everyone else is doing and that they're able to listen more freely i think when they play because they've spent so much time with it and so we can communicate you know as a conductor and you'll you'll know what i mean by this uh, there's that feeling when you've got to performance three or whatever and they have absolutely ingested this piece that you could do anything and mm. even with with tricky repertoire shostakovich nine something fantastic i could very easily not be there and they would do a fantastic version of the piece which for that repertoire is is quite hard to do as a as an orchestra mm. um and they can they can turn on on a, a tuppence you know they can suddenly change the contrast the dynamic the atmosphere the articulation because they are all watching they're all looking at each other and playing complete show music plus the interaction with the audience which i think is quite a different look and feel somehow yeah, uh, the two things that stand out for me there about what you said are that, yeah, much like the John Wilson Orchestra, actually, you know, the people that you book to come into Aurora Orchestra are well aware of the fact that they're probably going to be playing something from memory in four, three or four months' time. Much the same with John's Orchestra, you know, you're expected to play, the, in, especially in the strings, in a specific way, uh, you know, fast, narrow vibrato and with a lot of contact. And, and, and so they wholeheartedly embrace it because they're into it and they're up for it. And as you say, in a, in a contract orchestra, that's a lot harder sell. And then the second thing is, as you said, you know, you, you don't think every, every orchestra should play like this. But I, having watched that Symphony Fantastique um, show, and, and it is a show with the, the narrator coming in and out and all of the props that you had or whatever, there is absolutely no way you could do that as a show without everybody playing it from memory. I think it's paramount and, and it's a brilliant show. Um, wonderful thing so yeah hats off to you and um, yeah I'm just I'm just glad because I had a terrible memory when I was a player I'm just glad that uh, uh, I never had to do that um, I can see the benefits but for me it would have been an absolute nightmare <laughs> yeah but you know that I have players who say that and it's not the case no one does anyone playing repertoire at that level can can do it and there is something about being in a section of course as a violinist that means even then, you're aided by everyone else. So I, I, I totally know that you, you would be able to do it. In previous podcasts, I've asked conductors what differences there are between working in certain countries, either side of the Atlantic, for instance, or in this case, you know, you would, you've would you been chief conductor with a residency orchestra for five years in The Hague. You're soon to start in Helsinki with a Finnish radio symphony orchestra and your principal guest with the Gertzenich Orchestra in Cologne. Now, I wonder whether there are much or many differences between, let's say, the orchestra in The Hague and Cologne and then with the way that the orchestra musicians work uh, in Finland, uh, in Helsinki. Can you highlight any differences at all? Or are they just very similar? No, they're not similar <laughs> at all. Um, and look, any, any conductor knows this. And it's actually one of the privileges I often think of being a conductor is that you get to see all these different cultural um, groups of people. Now, of course, uh, I'm, I'm the first to say, you don't want to make stereotypes out of these things because no. um, it's lazy and it's um, inappropriate. However, there are significant differences and anyone who has conducted a Scandinavian or say Finnish orchestra would be able to tell you about the difference in rehearsal etiquette from say um, a Mediterranean mm. orchestra. Mm. Uh, so, you know, when I conduct in Finland, um, th they are a, a group of, unbelievably technically brilliant musicians. I mean, really top, top level. 
mm. who, when they rehearse, are silent <laughs> in, in terms of you, you stop at uh, wherever you stop it as you're conducting and that you're met with people listening to you, mm. which is a, a conductor's dream in many ways. Yeah. Uh, and then they start when you start them. There's, there's an, a, a real rehearsal discipline. Um, with a Finnish orchestra, just like a British orchestra, they're very, very quick at sight reading, at understanding contemporary music, which they play more of probably than any orchestra in the world, really. Mm -hmm. And um, they can just speed through repertoire, being able to play it incredibly well together. So, you know, there's that, it, that is a stereotype, of course, but it's, it's completely true. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, um, I must say, you know, an orchestra in Holland or Germany, you will probably find um, speaks more uh, in rehearsal and can be, um, you can get more of a sense immediately of, of the flavor of all their individual characters. And that's not necessarily um, a worse thing, it's a different thing. And, and what you might find there in a German orchestra is, as we always say, but it's true, you know, a, a focus rather than it being on the orchestra being playing together, for example. Um, or on rhythm, it's a focus on sound mm. and, and quality of, of musical phrasing, which of course you, you get also with a Finnish orchestra, it's just a question of priorities, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and so, you know, when, when, when you play repertoire, a particularly German repertoire in Gertsenich, um, Strauss, Mahler, which is their thing and they've, they've done since, you know, they used to work with Strauss and Mahler, they premiered Mahler 5 and Don Quixote, all those pieces, they, they have that in their blood and they sing it, you know, they sing it, uh, all these phrases with absolute conviction, but they can find certain rhythmic music, perhaps more difficult than a, um, a top British orchestra, let's mm. say. Um, so there are fascinating differences, aren't there? And, and yes. without differences, um, we'd be bereft because um, that, that wonderful sense of identity is so important. Well, there's also the other thing that you didn't touch on, but I can't think how, whether it, well, it was touched on slightly with uh, Jack von Stein, is also the amount of time that you have in places like Germany. You have more rehearsal time, and 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 the, therefore the pacing of rehearsals is is needs to be different from country to country as well, doesn't it? Once you've identified, you know, each orchestra's characteristic and whether they hone in on sound or whether they hone in on on ensemble or rhythm, then there's a different, there's also different flows of the rehearsal speed and how it works. And it does differ from country to country, doesn't it? Oh, hugely. I've lost track of the number of general directors of, of say, German or continental orchestras who say to me before the first rehearsal, don't be shocked. The first rehearsal will not be very good, but it will go up and up and up. Mm. <laughs> you know, that's their, they always say that probably just to British conductors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gertsenich, they perform Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and they start rehearsing on the Tuesday before. So they have a rehearsal Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's five days of mm -hmm. rehearsal. Not many rehearsals within that, so probably three, four hours maximum each day, because usually they're playing opera as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is a completely different process from a British orchestra where you are likely to have two days, sometimes one. Mm. of rehearsal which is very intense and very packed and just being able to free your head in that way I think is so important to have the space to let the music mature over that period. Brilliant wonderful answer my next question is one I've asked pretty much every conductor and you are no different Nick when you come to learn a new score do you have a process do you sit at the piano because you're a very good pianist and organist or do you just sit at your desk? Um, are you a marker of scores, pencils, coloured pencils, whatever? How do you start and what is your process if you have one? Well, it really depends if I have a history with the piece, of course. Mm. So I may be coming to conduct a piece I've known all my life but have never really opened a score of. And, yes. um, and you have a tradition with inside you, you know. Uh, and, and of course, it depends on the complexity of the piece. But say I was taking a piece that is, where there is a huge amount in it, I don't know, a, a Mahler symphony. Um, often actually, often before even thinking about it, I read a huge amount about Mahler at that time. 
about analysis of, of the music, you know, all sorts to get every conceivable side of what people think about him. Mm. And then I go, I just go into the music and I suppose I need to, in, in a piece like Mahler, a composer like Mahler, I would need to understand every bar of harmony. So if I can't hear it in my head, I'll take it to the piano and I'll work it out and I'll work out why the you know, clarinets are transposing in this part. And I need to know there what, what the structure is. And then I'll maybe focus on, on form instead of, you know, bar by bar. I'll, I'll try to get into my head, okay, well, this first movement is enormous. It's whatever, 25 minutes long. What's he doing? How does he break it up? If I can't understand it, I'll try and get people who've thought about this music, uh, <laughs> you know, to help me if it's mm. that written books or other people whatever um, and I think it's important not to be shy about that as a conductor because let's face it you know we, we in our lifetimes will perhaps interpret thousands of, of pieces where we may not have an instinctive understanding of all of them and sometimes you want to be able to say okay tell me about this piece what it what is it how does it work um, but that that can be a very different process if it's uh, you know um, a, a very complicated to conduct a uh, con contemporary piece where you mm. think, well, what I'm, I'm trying to work out here is how, how to do the blooming thing, you know, uh, and there I might get more quickly into it uh, and read less about it and, and just try and understand how the thing works musically in a very simplistic way. Mm. Uh, so of course it depends on, on, on the repertoire. And I'm assuming therefore uh, more writing in when it's a, writing of things into your scores when it's a contemporary piece than say a Mahler symphony or or much the same I mean you know I, I write comments and historical comments because like you I do some I do some homework and background reading I might write a historical comment in there and a phrase length here and um, whereas some conductors have said they write nothing in at all oh I'm not a nothinger um, I mean <laughs> like Mark used to say that to me I mean I think he writes very very little in his, his mm. score um, I don't write very much. I mean, I think in classical music, you know, in a Mozart symphony, you won't see that much in there because I want it to look pure. When it, if he does something crazy with a phrase structure, then I, I might. Mm. Um, I'm, when I'm conducting, I, I do like to see phrase structures. So, I mean, I know that there's bits in Shostakovich 4 that I will get lost in unless I um, see the phrase structures. Yeah. Or... Um, the, the, the quick movement in Britain's cello symphony or you know I know that I need to see a clarity on my score then so I will rule lines often to show where phrases mm. end uh, but that's more important to me than um, ringing instruments incessantly and putting huge amounts of color on mm. or writing a Mengelberg style all over the score I don't I don't do that but you, you know everyone has their own way and there's no right or wrong about it Nick, it's 10 questions time. And so we will start with what sound or noise do you love and what sound or noise do you hate? Okay, so I really hate the sound of either fingernails down a chalkboard or that polystyrene stuff that you get mm, mm. around the TV. <laughs> Even thinking about it now makes me feel quite ill. And the sound you love? Um, I love the sound of overtones singing. Oh, um, overtones, amazing. My grandmother used to get me to, she'd go around the house and she'd hit inanimate objects, fortunately inanimate, like, you know, the radiator or a sort of piece of wood. And she'd get me to sing what harmonics, what overtones I could hear from it. And she used to really persist, you know, really listen, 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 this, until I was quite good at singing, you know, four or five pitches from a sort of chair. Um, <laughs> and I love that because e everything has a pitch and, um, and we just need to listen for it, but we ignore so many overtones. If you had 24 hours free, what would you spend it doing? Oh, I would certainly walk. I'd be outside, I mean, ideally in a nice place. I love walking in the Lake District, for example, but being outside in nature is the most mind clearing of activities for me. 
and uh, ideally having people I like on the walk would be great. Um, but, but yeah, just being able to move outside in nature. Isn't that wonderful when you're guest conducting somewhere and you, the rehearsal schedule allows you to go and spend a long time walking and clearing your head. You know, I, I, I did some work in Cologne recently with the WGR Funkhouse Orchestra and basically had 24 hours free in the middle of the rehearsal schedule and to walk along the river there in Cologne and just think about what you've been doing, think about what's coming up and then once those 10 minutes of thinking have gone, just clear your head and watch the world go by and have a, have a meander. Yeah, it is, it is wonderful. And also, um, if you think about it, is how most composers wrote, well, a lot of them wrote the genius stuff that they did, from Berlioz through to Tchaikovsky, you know, Mahler, all these composers who, who wandered as they wrote, obviously needed to, to somehow move in order to engage their brains. Who would be a favourite conductor of yesteryear? Uh, well, I might surprise you slightly by saying, I'm not someone that particularly salivates over old conductors. Um, I, it, it's, it's weird. I, I've never been particularly drawn to thinking, you know, I'm not some, one of those people who as a teenager was, was sort of obsessed with Furt um, I I've never really sat down and listened to huge amounts of old recordings, although I, I certainly do when I'm studying a piece. So if I want to hear, um, you know, if I'm learning a Mahler symphony, I'll try and hear what Mengelberg was doing, if there's a recording, for example. Um, so funnily enough, there are two, uh, two uh, which are slightly tongue in cheek, which are uh, Berlioz and Mahler, uh, <laughs> because they both set um, new precedents and new standards for what conducting was. And I think we're incredibly important. Of course, we don't have recordings <laughs> of Berlioz conducting, but we have many um, anecdotal uh, stories of what they both did and I think um, in their ways they revolutionized conducting particularly Mahler who was an astonishing conductor must have been to get the job in um, New York and prior to that Vienna at such young ages uh, and they also taught us to respect the score and respect the, the notes that were on the score and the music there and um, that's something that of course now has reappeared I suppose um, particularly in the historical movement, to, to really think about uh, how music should and could sound and, and was performed. Um, if, if I'm being slightly less tongue-in-cheek, uh, there are two who are nearer the present day, um, Hanakor and Abado. Uh, Abado for, um, mostly for Mahler, but for many other things actually, uh, and Hanakor for everything, <laughs> uh, for being so dogmatic and it extraordinary in his approach uh, to music and pushing the boundaries of what players can do and how to think about music. And, and, and certainly as an inspiration to me, he, um, I never met him, um, but he, you know, through recordings and through um, watching concerts has uh, hugely influenced me. Um, so those, yeah, uh, more so than, um, as, as I say, Furt Wengler or Klemper or whatever. I normally cut out my responses to the answers that are given in the 10 questions because nobody wants to hear them. But I'm not going to cut this out because I think your first two answers of Berlioz and Mahler were brilliant. I can't imagine anybody else would have thought of that. But what you said is so true. I mean, admittedly, a lot of the eyewitness accounts of Berlioz conducting come from Berlioz himself and his yeah. wonderful memoirs. But you're right about Mahler. You know, uh, I think they're brilliant answers and thank you for giving them. Brilliant. And who would be a favourite current conductor? Well, I know the people that have influenced me the most who have been around in the last you know, 40, 50 years. Um, it's not going to be the first time this is mentioned, but as a British conductor, I grew up in the period where Simon Rattle has influenced everything about British orchestral music, and rightly so. Um, what an incredible mind and personality and and also just the way he has um, approached the role of conducting and, and being collegial, mm -hmm. understanding the psychology of orchestral musicians. You know, it's not a small thing because conductors didn't used to do that and, and he's bothered to do that. And that's his approach besides the intensity of his music making, which is astonishing and which we all, well, well I, I shouldn't speak for other people, but certainly, you know, a lot of people are trying to achieve that level of, of 
understanding and intensity of, of music. So um, I think, to be honest, nearly all conductors of my generation here in, in Britain have been pretty influenced by him. Mm. Uh, I, I am very lucky to live now in a point where period instrument work is um, sort of normal. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there were people that broke new ground on that. Uh, iconoclasts like Roger Norrington, who I did play under, um, and uh, I suppose even more importantly, John Elliott Gardner, mm. who, um, with such an incredible range of repertoire, has done so much, hasn't he? And um, despite, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever you may think of certain elements of, of um, you know, how he runs things or whatever, uh, he is an astonishing musician mm. who has um, injected so much energy and passion into so many different composers. And the list of, of composers is, is really wide. It's, when you look at it and think about it, it's much wider than you originally you start off thinking. Um, so he's, the, those people, those pioneers have made the life of, say, me so much easier because there is an understanding in, in the musicians that I work with now in this generation of how that music should go. Thank God I don't have to stomp my way through Mozart minuets in the way that people had to 50 years ago because it doesn't interest me at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dead right. <laughs> What is the hardest work you have ever conducted? Easy question in terms of the purely technical, horrendous time signature aspect. Yeah. And I can say this confident in the knowledge that no one else has conducted it, so they can't say, oh, come on, that's easy. Uh, it was a piece, I think it was 2016 or 17, um, in the BBC proms with the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. And they said to me a few months before, or oh, no, it was probably a year, year before, you know. Um, we want to do this piece by Messiaen, which has never been performed. It was a movement from um, Eclair sur l'Odela, mm. and he wrote a draft of it and then annotated it in the, in, the, you know, in the margins of how he wanted it to be orchestrated. And someone called Christopher Dingle, as Messiaen specialist, has, has put it up into his own version. I thought, great. Um, <laughs> it's only five minutes, lovely. <laughs> and it was horrendously difficult mm. uh, uh, so quick it, everything in 216 316 and 716 uh, changed tempo every two bars with you know, speedings up and slowing down or uh, uh, I mean uh, seriously a degree harder than anything in Turanga Leela or Eclair itself and uh, and almost impossible actually uh, and I it's the only piece I've ever had to do and I've done a lot of contemporary music where I had to um, well, A, really mark it up in different colours and B, put it on my piano and I remember just practising, conducting it and mm. feeling pretty chuffed if I got all the way through without <laughs> really cocking it up. Um, but it went all right, actually. I think it's, it's somewhere on YouTube. But, but uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a very difficult experience, actually. Which... It, it's worth pointing out, you know, I've done a couple of pieces of Messi and, and if you do a piece like Et Expecto, you might get a 30 second or one minute burst of multi-time signatures, very quick tempo, but that's it. It's 30 seconds. And then the next thing, usually something's a lot slower and a lot simpler to conduct, but that sounds horrendous. So you basically had five minutes of that constantly without mm. stopping. I mean that, yeah, that's, that's tough. That really is tough. And I've done exactly the same, just beat time. And then, you know, you get to the end and think, my God, I've done it. Um, I used, yeah, to use a, I used to use a sporting thing. Somebody once told me that Colin Montgomery, the golfer, would place, uh, would putt a hundred short six-foot putts in a row. Uh, and if, if he missed number 98, he'd start to get at naught. And, <laughs> and so I did the same thing. Even if I cocked up the penultimate bar, I'd think, right, back to the beginning, start again, see if you can do it. Um, but there, yeah, that's tough. It is tough. Yeah, and in, on the emotional front, of course, that's very different. Um, Oh, uh, I don't know, Marla 10 in some ways. I mean, actually, mm. it's, it's, I, I find it a very easy piece. Not, no, I should, I should rephrase that. I, it's not an easy piece to understand in any way. But I mean, I've done it a lot and I, I, I feel like uh, I'm inside it. But I find it so, God, so emotionally exhausting, actually. Yeah. Uh, 
but in a wonderful way, I'd come out the end of it and, and, and you know, feel shattered mm. physically and emotionally by it somehow. Oh, well, while you're on Marla 10, I shall throw you my, my crazy idea about the second movement. And for those who don't know the Derek Cook or Marla 10, Derek Cook version, the second movement is much like the Messian you've just talked about, one time signature after another. And I wrote a blog piece basically with my theory and the fact that it's about 700 bars and there are 500 different time changes in it. And I wondered whether, because it, he wrote it when he was in New York and there was this battle going on with him and Toscanini, not that either of them pushed the battle, other people were battling on their behalf. So I wonder whether he'd written that to show that he was the greatest conductor because if I write myself the hardest piece of music yet to be conducted, um, I can show how good I am. What do you think to that, that crazy notion that I came up with a few years ago? That's a very interesting point. Of course, he never did. Um, and there's no way Toscanini would have got through it. No. Uh, it is pretty hard, actually, until you've done it a few times and then it feels absolutely fine. But it, it's, yeah, no, it's, God, it's such, as you say, it just changes all the time. And, it's, um, <laughs> and also it requires the entire orchestra to be completely locked in to each other somehow. Yeah, it does. Um, but you're right about the emotion of it. You know, I did that piece with an amateur orchestra in London uh, a couple of years ago and the end just the end just felt shattering absolutely shattering for everybody um and that gorgeous flute solo so for anybody who doesn't know Marla 10 go and listen to it when traveling abroad to conduct what item could you not leave home without oh well it has to be a pillow because um i find the variety of pillows particularly in uh, continental country hotels, um, alarming. <laughs> I, I don't understand what is going on with the majority of German pillows, which are basically sort of non-existent bit of fabric with a couple of cotton wool buds stuck in between. I mean, the, the general height of a German pillow is about a centimetre. <laughs> and even if you stack five of them on top of each other, um, your head will still sort of cave in. So I actually take a pillow everywhere I go now, unless I'm completely sure that the hotel has a, a normal pillow, because a good night's sleep is quite important when you're <laughs> away conducting. So it's a bit odd, and I need quite a big suitcase, but um, it makes a difference. Since I decided to do that, I've enjoyed life more. Most people would think it odd, but at least three other conductors have said pillow. So um, you're not alone. Uh, oh, right. yeah. and, 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 and you're not alone in thinking that, that the, the hotel pillows in Germany are basically uh, a folded sheet, with, <laughs> which has been blown up with air. And that's about it. That <laughs> I can't stand them. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, where are we now? Here we go. Uh, what is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? Well, this can't be an original response, but being away from home is the hardest thing for me about being a conductor, being away from family, um, from kids. And, uh, you know, the internationalization of it is, is wonderful in many ways, but it's very um, strenuous upon one's, <laughs> well, one's relationships, one's health sometimes in terms of travel, uh, and also the environment. And I think um, it's not impossible that that will change over the next decades, particularly in the amount that orchestras are touring as well. Um, so uh, I would be quite pro elements of the localization of orchestras as they've sort of talked about in coronavirus times. Um, you know, the, 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 the idea that instead of um, necessarily going 7,000 7, miles to conduct a Sibelius symphony somewhere, uh, you can do that in your home country. Mm. But, it's happened for a reason and there are many good reasons why we all tour around and, and, and there are many great positives about it. I mean, I adore my work in, in all these foreign countries. So I'm sort of ambivalent about it, but um, it's definitely the hardest thing, isn't it? What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? It's got to be epidemiology nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but that would take me a while. Um, well, God, I, I, I'm nervous of, of saying this, but somehow politics, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know why, I'm just so frustrated with 
uh, well, the political system and, and elements of, you know, the actual politicians themselves. I just think there's such a small talent pool of politicians. I'm not implying that I would be any better, um, but uh, it'd be nice to be able to make a concrete difference. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure whether they do. They certainly do in a negative way at the moment. But, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm drawn to the idea of, of trying to help people and genuinely trying to make society a, a better and fairer one. And, um, you know, one can do that in certain ways within music. But, uh, yeah, there's a certain um, draw to doing that within politics. I'm sure I'd be absolutely rubbish, but it would be quite intriguing to have a go. Well, I think you get quite a lot of support because like all of the other conductors who've come onto my podcast, you've been honest. Um, whether that makes you a good politician or not is up for debate, <laughs> but I, th I think you get a lot of supporters for your honesty. <laughs> if the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Well, I can't really imagine being anywhere other than my kitchen because that's literally <laughs> where I've eaten every meal for the last three months, which has been bizarre because... Uh, as a conductor, you spend so much time in restaurants, but I love it. I mm. absolutely love being at home. I love knowing what is in the food that I'm eating, um, and I love cooking. And I've spent an enormous amount of time over the last three months cooking and expanding my repertoire and skills, small skill set, you know. Um, so the, I would be at home. I'd be with my wife and my three kids, and the youngest one would be making a terrible mess. She's just six months old on the floor with something. Um, but we would have to have, as our dessert, I'd work backwards, yeah. ganoffee pie, just mm -hmm. because I've never seen my children more excited about anything in life, weirdly, than a banoffee pie, which we cooked for the first time a few uh, weeks ago. I say cooked, I mean, you don't really have to do much. But uh, but th I think it's, it's the nicest thing they've ever eaten in their lives. And it was pretty delicious. <laughs> um, and I've been cooking loads of different Asian food, weirdly, because I eat a lot of it when I go away. Um, but it would have to be uh, some kind of, of probably a Goan fish curry. Ooh. That's what it is. Uh, and um, we'd have a spicy version, and our children would have something less so. Um, and it would probably be eaten in about 25 minutes maximum because that's that's the issue with family dinners is that they have very little um <laughs> recourse to sort of understanding that you should chat and then eat and whatever um and that would be it and there'd be huge amounts of mess but i'd be very happy and would you wash that down you and your wife wash that down with a nice glass of wine or would you like to put a beer with your go and curry definitely a beer just a simple whatever corona oh no god <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Considering their, their shares were, went down whatever 60 percent because of idiots in america not, not <laughs> i think i'm going to say corona <laughs> well um uh, uh, if i can stop like, giggling and laughing um nick real pleasure thoroughly enjoyed our chat today and i hope when this is all over we can share a curry and a corona beer together very soon that would be very nice indeed. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for your time. A Mike on the Podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. I have turned my article on the scherzo from Mahler's Tenth Symphony into a mini podcast episode on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash a Mike on the Podium and after subscribing, you'll be able to hear that mini episode as well as being able to hear a whole new set of podcast interviews called Is the Mic Working? Next time, I chat with a French conductor whose career has been truly international, having studied in the US and the UK, as well as having title jobs in the UK, US, Belgium, China and France. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>